Welcome to Institute for Diplomacy and Economy YouTube channel. Today we will discuss Libya and its regional dynamics. And my guest is Dr. Jalal Harshavi. Dr. Jalal Harshavi is a political scientist, scientist specifically focusing on Libya. And he is an associate fellow at Royal, in Royal United Services Institute for Defense and Security Studies. Welcome Dr. Jalal Harshavi and thank you for accepting my invitation for this program. Thank you very much for having me. Um, my first question is about a general overview of the, the situation in Libya, actually. In the last few years, we are seeing relatively less and less uh, news, of, news of violence from Libya. And in addition to that, we also see some diplomacy between the sides. And how, how do you see this situation? Is it... Uh, transitioning period to a more negotiated or stable peace in the country, or is it as calm before the, before the storm? Uh, none of those things. Uh, usually I'm, uh, I'm always prompt to reject the notion of transition. Transition means that you have roughly an idea of what the destination it is, is going to be. And I mean, uh, whenever people used the word transition in the, uh, uh, Middle East, North Africa region since 2011, it turned out to be completely uh, inadequate because transition means that you are uh, initiating a journey and you know where you're going to land. And uh, like the case of Tunisia, for example, is is clearly uh, an example of why you shouldn't use the word transition. You know, you have no idea that you're going somewhere. It's not as functional or as uh, useful as a journey. It's mostly dysfunctional. And uh, Libya, you're right, is not a conflict. And it's difficult to sometimes keep that in mind because people have stopped following it. And so they keep using the phrase, the Libyan conflict. It is not a conflict. There's no meaningful violence. There are uh, from time to time clashes, but those clashes have nothing to do in terms of their scale it are much smaller, much more short lived than anything we saw uh, before June 2020. So for me, June 2020 arguably is the end of the latest bout in internationalized civil war in Libya. And you are when using, it comes to the... You are, you are using a rough piece in one of your articles for the situation in Libya. Yeah, it's a rough piece in the sense that it's a lull. It's a technical lull, but uh, you should use always an empathet to remind people that it's not really peace because it's not as uh, virtuous or as um, pleasant as uh, the, the peace would uh, would imply. For example, a lot of the population is suffering, but it's not suffering because of uh, physical violence. It's suffering because of other things uh, like um, inflation uh, in the middle of the year where oil prices are well sustained. Uh, oil production uh, volumes are well sustained and really Libya should not be suffering in terms of its population. It shouldn't be suffering from the inflationary pressures that we have seen. So there's got to be some other explanation. It's certainly not because of uh, the world economy uh, parameters. Um, and, uh, and of course, you know, armed groups have not laid down their weapons. They're still very active. They, are, they continue to buy weapons. Um, some armed groups were dismantled because of some incidents, but by and large, most of the, mo like the meaningful armed groups have continued to grow. They have to continue to grow in the physical violence world, you know, in terms of like, um, as I said, acquisition of, of weaponry, but also acquisition of, uh, bureaucratic influence, administrative influence, um, skills in terms of international diplomacy. Um, for example, one of the worst armed groups in the, the AAA area uh, by the name of the uh, uh, Stabilization Support Apparatus uh, has a dungeon that uh, uses all kinds of uh, human rights uh, abuse techniques to uh, project power. And the United States of America was happy to uh, work closely with it when it came to uh, um, handing over uh, the uh, Lockerbie suspect in uh, December 2022. So um, this is an example of uh, an armed group that is smart enough to maintain its own uh, international diplomacy 
and Western democracies have been happy to work closely and respect uh, the worst armed groups in Libya, both East and West. Uh, so this is something we could discuss. But but in all cases, the um, the uh, to go back to this idea that uh, there's some diplomacy between the East and, and West, there is, but it's not good news. You know, a lot of people say it would be great if they spoke, it would be great if we have some kind of reconciliation. We've had those things. We've had a communication channel between East and West, but for um, money arrangement purposes. And this has not been good news for anybody. It hasn't been good news in terms of state building. It has not, this communication, this absence of, uh, of, uh, of a war combined with a, a willingness to speak on a regular basis has not produced anything useful in terms of making the formal state institutions more robust. It has not increased the chances of really achieving uh, a, a durable, lasting form of peace. And uh, it has not made it possible to get closer to elections. Arguably, you could even say that it's going in the other direction. The communication that exists between the leaders of the West, uh, Western part of Libya and the Eastern part of Libya, this kind of reconciliation has made it more difficult to to uh, really expect any form of uh, credible elections in uh, in the foreseeable future. So sometimes you have to wish for you, what, what, you know, you have to to be careful what you wish for. And uh, reconciliation between uh, the highest elites that are currently in power is basically geared towards better uh, coexistence in terms of splitting the spoils, splitting the money, and and making sure that uh, they stay both both sides stay in power as long as possible. So it's not a good it's not a good thing at all. It's actually negative for the Libyan public. So the. The current diplomacy is just consolidating the situation in Libya, not uh, getting it better. Um, I'm, I'm not, it's not even a consolidation. Consolidation means that you you agree on the foundations and you make things more stable and uh, you kind of build something that maybe looks a little bit ugly but ha has uh, the, all the chances to remain unchanged over a period of multi uh, of multiple years that's not the case it's not a consolidation like it's just a way of basically kicking the can down the road and finding in an improvised way um uh, solutions in terms of splitting the money um both illicit and licit and so it's not a consolidation it's just uh basically um phone calls, but it comes with no benefit in terms of being able to um, have a future that is a little bit more predictable or um, making sure that there's no relapse into conflict, if there's a misunderstanding or anything like that. It's it's really probably one of the worst form of reconciliation you could possibly imagine. Uh, how, how, uh, how likely is a new spike in violence in Libya? Do you see all uh, yeah, there's a, um, yeah, there's one one form of violence that I, that is, is potentially in the in the in the cards for this year, which would happen within uh, northwestern Libya. So the divisions within northwestern northwestern Libya, even including Tripoli itself, there is a non-zero chance of uh, of serious violence there, because um, what I have been speaking about since the beginning of this presentation has been the communication channels between the main family that dominates Benhazi, the Haftar family on the one hand, and the, the Beba family in Tripoli. So the, the problem within Northwestern Libya is that there are other groups that don't necessarily accept that the family of Abdul Hamid the Beba remains in power uh, much longer. So there are like Northwestern Libya is a much more densely populated province. It's more diverse, uh, including politically. So there are powerful groups that are uh, increasingly talking to each other and they have this common stance that it should be difficult for the, the Beba family to remain in power. So the, the, the divisions within Northwestern Libya are to me much more serious and more dangerous 
than um, what if you just look at east-west. Of course, if uh, those bad predictions turn out to be correct, in other words, if this pessimistic scenario materializes, you have like violence between within within Tripoli, let's say, then uh, the faction in the east will look at it opportunistically and might use means of violence, not necessarily directly, but might start sending weapons to a particular faction uh, in a way that um, exploits the uh, the division or the, the violence, let's say, that would happen within within the greater Tripoli area. So this is why I keep saying that, you know, the form of peace that we have is very shallow. And we should not forget that uh, Tripoli is very much divided. How, how about the role of the regional powers? Because, uh, you know, uh, the role of UAE, Turkey or Egypt, and uh, maybe France too, and they are very inflation pl players in this, was in the, uh, were in the inflation players in the Libyan civil war. Uh, and since 2020, we see a diplomatic uh, negotiations between the sides. How those negotiations and diplomatic normalization, as you know, last week or the week before Erdogan was in Cairo, it's a big step uh, in terms of the region. So uh, how it how was, uh, how did it influence the, the situation in Libya? Mm. Well, first of all, I mean, the Libya as a theater is a very dysfunctional theater. What I'm saying is, if you look at the rapprochement that has occurred between the UAE and Turkey, typically since 2021, it has been top of the line. You, know, you couldn't have hoped for a more genuine rapprochement. There, there's very good quality dialogue with a real desire to work hand in hand, especially in the comic file. And um, so the communication between Ankara and Abu Dhabi has been uh, quite excellent. And we, what we had uh, unfold over the last couple of years is probably the best version of what we could have uh, hoped for. And uh, I would say that Turkey is also very authentic in its desire to woo Egypt and, and make sure that you know all the bitterness that might have ex existed between Egypt and Turkey in the past is gone now. So. We are basically witnessing uh, an environment where, yes, Turkey is really trying to cultivate Egypt and the, uh, the rapprochement, as I said, between the UAE and Turkey has been quite good. And, uh, but if we forget that the reality in, in, uh, in Libya is first of all dominated by the locals. I mean, the, the, the conflict in Libya has never been an international conspiracy. It has always had a uh, very major indigenous kernel like uh, the you know the divisions are libyan first of all and then of course the foreign states have played a huge role um, exacerbating all of this but it's not it's not an international conspiracy so as you solve as you resolve all those uh, antagonisms that existed uh, outside of libya it doesn't solve libya for two reasons because first of all libyans continue being agents and the other thing also is that um, the um, a lot of the um, the problems are not are basically being accumulated. For example, like um, the Russian presence you know, cannot is not going to go away. There's no scenario where the Russians are going to leave Libya. So you can resolve the Turkey Egypt difference. You can resolve the Turkey UAE difference. It doesn't mean that Russia will disappear. And and when Russia stays. It stays also because it has a very acute, clear recognition that Libya is inherently dysfunctional. So it means a lot of opportunities for an external player that has a parasitic, you know, behaves like a parasite. So, uh, and the other thing also is that, um, you know, if you have the accumulation of all those uh, anomalies from an economic institutional perspective, then you know, it's not because foreign states stop fighting that they are going to actually go in and fix the problem. They're not going to fix those problems. Those problems are not going to stay. So, for example, if you have a lot of corruption um, that uh, attracts a certain form of reconstruction, a reconstruction effort that would see a huge amount of public wealth being stolen in the form of, uh, you know, um, side payments and bribery, diversions, all this. So, you know, no foreign state is going to 
uh, fix those. And if they can profit, they will also profit. So I would say that both Egypt and Turkey stand to profit from uh, from a certain form of corruption. And, and the UAE also has not been an anti-corruption uh, uh, actor. So all those dysfunctions keep accumulating. And, um, and, and so it's not because you see a, a handshake between Erdogan and Sisi or Erdogan and uh, Mohammed bin Zayed that that it means that uh, it translates into uh, those actors rolling up their sleeves and fixing Libya. Libya is not their money, it's not their country, it's not their public suffering. So all of these things tend to continue. So it's it's not enough. It's, it's much easier for a foreign player to exacerbate the problem than to fix it. Uh, you mentioned the agency of... And, and, but I'm sorry to interrupt you, but France is no, it's not really important anymore. Uh, yeah, you mentioned uh, the agency of local actors in Libya, and mm -hmm. in in your article, in, uh, not article in War on Drugs, you also suggest that the Turk uh, United States should encourage uh, actors like Turkey and UAE to use mm -hmm. their influence to shape a better future in Libya. So even if these local, uh, these regional actors like Turkey and UAE wanted to build a more prosperous or more stable situation in Libya. Do they, are, are they able to do that? They have enough uh, in instruments to make it better in Libya or? Uh, or yeah, they can do a lot of things. Yeah, they can do a lot of things. For example, like Turkey has the ability to um, precipitate change in, um, in Tripoli, for example. Uh, the U.S., uh, if it tried, could have um, an effect on the behavior of uh, regional players. Um, there's a lot of um, power that is not used by, uh, by, by foreign states, including the United States. So the United States, for example, is quite content with the current situation in reality. It says that it wants elections. It says that it wants all kinds of things. But deep down, I think you can argue that the United States actually sees the current dynamic in a in a rather positive light. You know what's you know there are other problems in the region. You know and uh, Libya is kind of chugging along, and um, oil extraction is at 1.2, 1.25 million barrels a day. There's no major fighting. So you have this very superficial form of, uh, of um, interpretation of the current dynamic that is uh, that basically causes the United States to not try. It doesn't, it's not in the business of rocking the boat. It doesn't want it to um, make any drastic decision. It doesn't want to um, shock any of the players. It doesn't want to lose the communication channel with any of the meaningful uh, rulers that are currently dominating uh, the landscape. So there's a very large amount of complacency uh, on the part of the United States. So it means that the United States is not really trying to use its own power. Does it have power? Yes, there's a lot of unused power that it's not trying to use it. Um, so uh, we should, you know, if when the United States says, you know, what can I do? You know, there's nothing I can do. You know, this is too much for me. It's, it's because it's not trying. Um, how, how about uh, in terms of Turkey and the UAE? Uh, do you think the same thing for them? Uh, even if they want to build, as I said, uh, what, do they have capacity to influence local actors in Libya and uh, solve these local dynamics? Because uh, yeah, but what you have to define what is that they want to solve? What what kind of change do they do they want to see? I mean, um, Turkey is not very happy. You know, Turkey is not super happy, like it had a lot of ambitions, especially economically. Uh, when it, it intervened uh, beginning in uh, December 2019, um, that are still unfulfilled. So it really wanted to win billions and billions and billions. It wanted to win like probably around $20 billion worth of, of reconstruction contracts. And uh, it hasn't 
So we are sitting here almost four years later and uh, the results have been quite mixed. So things are moving slowly, but they're still moving in, in a direction that is kind of Turkey friendly. So there's now no reason to panic or lose your patience if you're Turkey. It's mediocre, but it's kind of okay. So that's the, you know, what is it that, you know, is Turkey is going to lose sleep because there's no elections in Libya? Same question about the UAE. Are they going to go, oh my God, you know, how come there's no liberal democracy in Libya? They don't, those are not, um, that, those are not uh, foreign policies driven by the desire to spread liberal democracy. So, you know, as long as, you know, you have this why fix it if it's not broke kind of philosophy, those actors that do enjoy a lot of influence, they could make changes. They, they uh, also are trying to be careful not to lose patience for something that is not really uh, super crucial from their perspective. So, and, um, and again, neither is very successful. So I'm not saying that they're very happy. I'm not saying they're like rubbing their hands and, and congratulating themselves for exploiting uh, it's it's kind of acceptable what has happened, but uh, this, for example, like if you look at the the UAE in the hydrocarbons sector, it has uh, really um, experienced multiple defeats over the last year or so. There's a lot of projects that were supposed to be UAE friendly and uh, collapsed. Those projects collapsed. So it's very approximate. It's very rough, you know, and it's very mediocre. But it's not adverse. It's not hostile. It's not something that causes pain. And also, you have this mentality that says, you know, as if it's acceptable, even if it's not great, I still have the option to jack up my game or ramp up my game later on. I still have this free option of going in more seriously if my focus were to move back into the area. So, you know, the UAE, for example, has been able to do. In Libya, what it needed, like the strict minimum, like sending weapons to the rapid support forces in uh, in Sudan, all these things that were kind of dominating the year 2023. Economically, the UAE has been disappointed, but it's okay. You know, there's nothing super bad to report. And I would say the same thing about Turkey. Turkey is not super excited by the economic wins. It's not certain that it's gonna win, win a lot of the contracts as part of the reconstruction of the uh, coastal city of Derna. Egypt is winning a lot of the contracts there. The UAE is also beating Turkey. Turkey would like a piece of the cake. It's not, but it's probably gonna get, you know, a few crumbs here and there. And, uh, you know, and uh, the relationship between Turkey and the Eastern part of Libya will continue to improve slowly. So all of this is kind of okay, you know, it's acceptable. It's not great, it's not brilliant, but it's okay. You, you have this told how, So I'm, I, I'm not talking on my behalf, I'm speaking, trying to reconstruct the perception of those two regional players. Yeah, uh, you have talked about the tensions within Northwestern uh, Libya. Uh, are those tensions, uh, are they any uh, potential uh, threats for the future of Turkey's influence in the in 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 this region uh, I think Turkey is very much aware it's very much aware first of all that um, that those things could happen you know it knows that it should think about those potential developments where you have violence that would kind of slip out of control and Turkey will, in this particular case, will have to move fast to put out the fire. Um, so it is a very much, it has demonstrated the fact that it's aware, it has demonstrated its awareness about, you know, it's more about, you know, it's not about like going aggressively on the side of one side against, you know, one side, the side of one camp against the other camp or anything like that. What it's trying to do is like kind of, you know, keep its options open, you know, obviously it, it has a bias. It, it would love to see a status quo prevail, you know, doesn't see any rush in changing the prime minister or anything like that. But it also knows that things could happen from a very indigenous perspective that would be 
substantial enough to require like a different fix, you know, something that maybe would uh, see Turkey maybe abandon the current prime minister and 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 uh, come up with some other arrangement. So it's trying to like be agile and try, and it's very much aware of the, of the fact that there are very deep rooted divisions and and bitter fault lines within northwestern Libya. I say it's aware because whenever there were incidents, Turkey, for example, in very acute moments, like uh, the typical example is uh, the 17th of August, 2022. Uh, Turkey did play a big role in that very violent day. But a few months later, it tried to restore communication with the parts that it, uh, it didn't help. So there were militias that were crushed that day, partly because of Turkey. And then as things, as soon as things cooled off, Turkey rushed to invite those leaders to Istanbul, put them in a hotel, you know, make them feel loved, make them feel integrated in the, in the various conversations. And so you have this attitude that consists in intervening only when it's strictly necessary and then try to kind of fix it from a diplomatic perspective because um, all of this is kind of unfixable. Right. So if, if the divide between Libyans is not fixable in the short term, what you do is like, of course, you're going to have a favorite, but you're also going to try and stay in conversation with the other guy uh, and, and kind of like try to go through the months, hoping that things don't explode. Yeah. And uh, as you said, then Turkey has enough maneuvering room or to uh, make necessary interventions or move uh, its position uh, alongside, the, uh, alongside the, the conflict. Uh, my... But the things could go also bad. I mean, I'm not saying things are always going to magically turn out to be okay from, from uh, Turkey's perspective. You could have a scenario where things just turn out to be a long battle in Tripoli or near Tripoli and, uh, and, and it just ends up being bad for everyone, including for Turkey. It's possible. It's part of the possible. Yeah. Um, my next next question is about the diplomacy between the Turkish diplomacy opening in Libya, uh, the uh, actors from Benghazi, and uh, as you said, the Turkey has had until now a mediocre, on, only mediocre returns from uh, yeah. So mm -hmm. maybe to guarantee or secure its interest, mainly the maritime deal and uh, the the investments uh, that estimate to value at 20 billion dollars. Uh, so, do you think these diplomatic openings of Turkey uh, can secure or can give what Turkey expects from them? Yeah, it's slow. It's a slow process. Um, Ankara would love the pro for the process to be a little bit faster. Um, and, uh, and you're right, it's, the East is very crucial because it has a lot of um, reconstruction projects, even now, even more now because of Derna. So if, if we had had this conversation six months ago, there was no Derna, right? Before the events of September, September 10th, 2023, there was no reconstruction. Like Derna itself is probably going to necessitate up to four, perhaps even $5 billion of, uh, of projects, and you also have the reconstruction of Benghazi that has already started. So when Turkey looks at all these, it really wants a piece of it. And so this has nothing to do with maritime. It's just, you know, what happens on the ground. And even from a, um, an oil perspective, there are things that should happen in the East and and Turkey would, would look at participating in those. There, are, there have been Turkish companies you know, discussing um, some development opportunities in the hydrocarbon sector on the ground. I'm not talking about the sea. And of course, if these things happen, then you end up with a better relationship with the authorities in the East. And even those relationships are pretty actually are pretty good already. But if you have even more of an improvement, then you could even discuss what Turkey would love, which would be exploration under the water. And uh, because it's the East, you know, like if you look at the uh, 
the exclusive economic zone as defined by Turkey in the in its uh, agreement with Tripoli from November 2019. Uh, you know, the east is what matters, is the waters of the east, not the waters of the west. Uh, so, so I really insist on the fact that you need first some economic opportunities on Libyan soil to be captured by Turkey, then that would actually and start like a virtual circle relationship in terms of having a better and better rapport with the leaders in the East. And then gradually you could even um, foresee a possibility of doing the exploration that Turkey has always wanted to carry out in that area off of Derna, actually. But of course, Turkey had to, had, has to rival with uh, Egypt, maybe Russia, or maybe UAE for these projects and these sports, right? Yeah, but uh, it, it has done its homework. You know, Russia is not really in a rush to be active in that domain. And uh, if you look, as, as we said, you know, in terms of the rapprochement that Turkey was able to deliver versus the UAE and versus um, Egypt, it has really done its homework. So it's uh, it's it's possible that it might happen within the next couple of years. Yeah. Um, my last question is more hypothetical uh, about this maritime deal. You know, it is very a very sensitive issue in Turkey because of its nationalist uh, perverse Turkey and the, the the concept of blue homeland. And mm -hmm. even in the best case, uh, let's consider a Libya united more prosperous, stable, even and uh, very, maybe, I don't know, you, you, you can imagine. Uh, in that case, uh, can Turkey make Libya accept uh, this maritime deal? How, how do you see its prospect? Well, I mean, it's, it's really um, a matter of resilience and a matter of patience. It's, uh, it's a de facto situation that Turkey needs first, it needs to preserve that memorandum of understanding because it signed two memorandum of understanding pertaining to the maritime aspect. One in November, 2019 and another one in October, 2022. The one in October, 2022 was uh, annulled. It was considered invalid by an appeals court in Tripoli. And you might have another appeal that would take it to all the way to the Supreme Court of, of Libya. And uh, it would have need like this appeal will need to be recorded within the next 50 days or something. There's only like a month and a half left. So that memorandum of understanding is already in trouble. But the original one signed by um, the Prime Minister Siraj government uh, in November 2019, still there. So it's not a deal, it's just a memorandum of understanding. But the idea would be to, first of all, not lose it, keep it there as, as a starting point of something, some kind of ratification that would be delivered by the parliament. But of course, the, for the parliament to deliver this, it would need a lot of things in return. So right now, you know, those kind of sacrifices, you know, for example, sacrificing the prime minister in Tripoli or something big that trip, that Ankara would need to deliver in order to get, it's too early. It's not like right now, the priority is not the maritime dimension. The priority is like stability on the ground, you know? So the idea is to kind of like continue talking to all the parties, you know, invite the, the president of the parliament for a second time something that is probably going to happen in the next few days, you know, show respect, show the ability to maintain all those new lines of communication and then kind of like go through the months without anybody attacking the original memorandum of understanding. And maybe if there's a change, take advantage of that moment to kind of ask for the ratification as, as, a, as, a, as a gift in exchange of some other gift that would be given by by Turkey, but you really like the right now. The key is to just, you know, uh, survive to play another day. You know, it's not so much to make like a breakthrough or or give it like an implementation. It's just to keep that piece of paper as symbolically still valid, and potentially get ready, or be ready, remain ready to use it as a starting point for the next step that would take place sometime in the medium term future. 
So that's it's really a long game. You know, the idea is to just still preserve those few things, not give them up, not see them sacrificed or destroyed or attacked. And then when you see the right environment, which is not now, uh, move in fast and get something to get a, like a step. And this is, to me, if I were to describe the philosophy of Turkey, that would be the philosophy that we, are, we have been witnessing. So Turkey is very, very patient sometimes. You know, we saw it in Northern Cyprus. We saw it in other, uh, like, uh, Western Syria. And, you know, almost all the theaters, you have two several modes of operation on the part of Turkey. Sometimes it moves very fast, like it did when it saw the opportunity in 2019. It intervened in Tripoli, got those two memo memorandum of understanding signed, it moved fast. But you also have another side, which is to show the ability to stay resilient and go through the months without losing. And just making progress when you can and not lose things, not not recede, not go in the, uh, the wrong direction. So this is more, I think, what we should be expecting when it comes to the maritime side of things. Dr. Harshavi, thank you for making time and joining our program. And uh, we hope to see you in later in, uh, in future programs. And thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you for the, uh, the trust. Bye-bye.